As we prepare to read from 1 Timothy, let me take a moment and welcome those who are worshiping in the Fellowship Hall. We're glad to have an interactive service there as well and look forward to your response to the sermon and also those who are worshiping with us online. It's nice to have a growing community online as well. So here now the Word of God as it comes to us from 1 Timothy. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, for the sake of the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I'm grateful to God whom I worship with a clear conscience as my ancestors did. When I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day, recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I'm reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that lived first in your grandmother Lois and then in your mother Eunice, and now I am sure lives in you. For this reason, I remind you to rekindle the gift of God that is within you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of cowardice, but rather a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. Do not be ashamed then of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel, relying on the power of God who saved us and called us with a holy calling not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. This grace was given to us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. May God add understanding and insight to this word. Don McCain, a maverick senator and presidential candidate and war hero, died last week after a 13-month battle with glioblastoma. McCain will be remembered for a lot of things, mostly for his refusal, his brave refusal, to be released from the Hanoi Hilton without the accompaniment of his other service members. But he'll also be remembered for his acerbic wit and for choosing Tina Fey to be his presidential running mate. Before he died, he, he wrote a letter to the people of this country encouraging us to remember who we are and the values that guide us. He writes, we are 325 million opinionated, vociferous individuals, and yet we have always had so much more in common with each other than in disagreement. And if only we remember that and believe in the promise of America. Remember, nothing is inevitable here. Remember, Americans never quit. We never surrender. Remember, we never hide from history. We make history. It was a bold, parting benediction. In our scripture passage today, we encounter a similarly bold, parting benediction from another vigorous, opinionated, sometimes unpredictable leader who had spent time in prison at the hands of the government. The Apostle Paul will die soon. He knows that. But before he does, there are a few things he wants to be sure that his followers, and especially Timothy, his son in faith, remember after he's gone. Now, we can tell, if you read through the letter, you can kind of tell that Paul is worried about Timothy. We don't know precisely why, but it, it would appear between the lines that Timothy is experiencing some crisis of faith. So Paul says, I'm reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that first lived in your grandmother." Mother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I'm sure lives in you. But it sounds like Paul may not be quite as sure as he'd like to be, especially since just a few paragraphs later, Paul also tells Timothy, don't be ashamed of me, Timothy. Don't be ashamed of my testimony to Jesus, and don't be ashamed of my imprisonment. It sounds like Timothy might be to Paul like that teenager who asked his parents to drop him off a few blocks before school so as not to be embarrassed by being seen with them. We don't know the particular of the problems, but it seems that perhaps Timothy was ashamed of Paul because of his imprisonment. Or maybe it really was that Timothy was embarrassed because he wouldn't risk his own imprisonment for the sake of his faith like Paul did. We don't know. But we do know that faith can become fragile and that finding God in this world 
is not always easy, and neither is trusting God with our lives and with the lives of those people and things that are most precious to us. Who among us hasn't had times when our faith has felt strong and robust and confident only to watch it spiral down into significant doubt and fragility? We never completely escape the questions of faith. Faith is not a constant. It's a living, evolving, sometimes elusive dimension of our lives. Now, we may not know precisely what caused Timothy's faith crisis, but we do know what Paul encourages him to do about it, and that is to remember. Four times in four verses, Paul uses words that reflect remembering. When I remember you in my prayers, he writes, recalling your tears, he writes, I long to see you and I'm reminded, he says, and I remind you to rekindle that gift of God that is within you. Over and over, Paul exhorts Timothy to remember because he knows that strength comes from remembering. Now, some of you here will remember the high drama of the Iran-Contra hearings when the U.S. government admitting to selling weapons clandestinely to Iran and then using the funds to wage an illegal war in Central America. And I'll always remember the day when Robert McFarlane testified before Congress and admitted that the Reagan administration had also sought the release of Joseph Sicipio, a captured CIA agent in Lebanon, but when the prisoner was actually released, it turned out not to be Joseph Sicipio, the CIA guy, but Ben Weir, a Presbyterian missionary who had also been captured in Lebanon. And Weir happened to be on Princeton Seminary's campus on the day of McFarland's testimony. So when this news broke, you can imagine national news media found Weir and converged on him. And when they did, this gentle old missionary stood in the pulpit of Miller Chapel on Princeton Seminary campus and spoke calmly about his 16 months in captivity. And he said what kept him sane, and, and actually more than sane, what kept him hopeful during that time was his faith, and specifically Scripture. But the interesting thing is his captors did not allow him to have a Bible so he had to rely on the scripture that he had committed to memory. And so he remembered the Christmas stories. He remembered the parables that Jesus told. He remembered when his meal would come, all the feeding stories of the 5,000, and even Jesus' last supper, which we will remember today. And then he remembered the letters of Paul, especially the ones that were written from prison. And he held on to the words like gifts to remind him that the present storm of his life would eventually end and he would come through the other side. So I wonder what kind of things you find helpful to remember when you struggle with faith. Maybe yours is a scripture passage. Perhaps yours is a song. Maybe yours is a poem. But I encourage you, whatever they are, to, to identify them. And go ahead and write them down. Write down some hopeful, helpful message from Scripture that can offer you strength in a time of turbulence. And take them with you wherever you go. Catholic theologians understand this better than Protestant theologians, and they suggest that remembering is almost sacramental, that it's a means of grace. It's a sacred gift that brings nothing less than the very presence of God. Now, let's be careful. This is a lot more than nostalgia. Paul is not telling Timothy, dial back the clock. Remember the good old days when life was simple and kids didn't have to play soccer on Sunday morning back when all was in right order. What he's doing is he's telling Timothy to remember the faith of his mother and his grandmother and to recall the specific time that Paul laid his hands on him in prayer, probably at his baptism, perhaps at his ordination. In other words, he's telling him, remember the people and the experience that rooted you in faith, those moments in your life when God's very presence became palpable and formative. It's an important reminder. There's a wonderful writer named Nadia Boltz Weber. She's an unlikely Lutheran pastor. She has more tattoos than she does hair, and her language is so salty, she'd probably get kicked out of the Navy. 
So she grew up in, in the conservative Church of Christ where people taught her early that as a girl, she was not equipped to be a pastor. Women didn't do that. Women couldn't, could teach children, but when the boys made it to middle school, well, men really need to take over all the teaching. Yeah, I've been surprised to learn in recent days that some people actually still think that. And, and after a long and destructive teenage life and early adulthood life, Nadia Boltzweber began to sense that contrary to the church of her childhood, God was actually calling her into ministry. And eventually she went home to tell her parents. Now you can imagine how delicate this encounter was going to be. She was nervous, she was fearful of their response, and she said, and when I told them, at that moment my father got up Silently, he walked to a bookshelf and he took down his worn, leather-bound Bible. Here we go, I thought, he's going to beat me with a scripture stick. He opened it up, but he didn't read about women being silent in church. He read from Esther, but you were born for such a day as this. And then he closed his Bible and he asked his wife to join him and laying hands on Nadia Boltzweber in prayer and offering her a blessing. And she writes, some blessings, like the one my conservative Christian parents gave to their soon-to-be Lutheran daughter who had put them through hell, some blessings stay with you for the rest of your life. And Paul says, remember your grandmother Lois. Remember your mother Eunice, and the faith that lived in them. We don't know anything else about these women, but Paul saw them as a source of strength for Timothy's faith. Now, so, some people are not so fortunate as to have parents and grandparents who model faith, but I don't think that's Paul's point. I think Paul's point is to draw strength from the memory of whomever set before us an example of faith. For some, that's a parent and a grandparent. For others, it's a teacher or a coach or a minister or a scout leader or a mentor or a counselor, whomever God puts in our lives as a gift to strengthen faith. For me, one person was a paternal grandfather. For most of my childhood, this gentle elderly man lived across the hall from me. His bedroom was across the hall. And at night, he would pull out his tiny King James Version pocket Bible in one hand and put it in one hand. And then he would pull out his magnifying glass in his other hand. And he would read the Sermon on the Mount. And he would never preach, never, not in a million years. And he would rarely speak it of faith, except when a conflict would arise in our house. Now, I'm sure in your house you've never had a conflict arise, but every once in a while in the family of my childhood, a conflict would come up, a little, little difference of opinion about something or other. And, and that's when my grandfather would amble down the hall and he would crack my door open and he would look in and he would say, I don't know much, but I do know this. Let your light so shine before others that they can see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. And then he would shut my door and retire to his room for the evening. And on those weeks when the mixture of my life is more unbelief than belief, I try to take Paul's advice and to remember that and to recognize my grandfather's faith as a means of grace, as a sacramental gift because uh, the truth is, this, this faith of ours is too big, and this life of ours is too complicated for any of us to hold on to faith all the time. So in those moments of vulnerability and doubt, even in those moments of downright disbelief, it's important to remember those who have modeled faith for us, who impart it to us, and who, when we need them to, will actually hold on to faith for us. Some, like Timothy, will have a grandmother and a mother on that list. Some, like me, might have a grandfather or a coach or a teacher. There can be all kinds of people on that list. But when life gets challenging, when doubt sets in, when decisions get very difficult and we need to rekindle that gift of faith that is within us, in other words, when it matters most, we can remember the saints that God has placed in our lives and be reminded what it means to trust and to follow and to pattern our lives 
after the sacrificial pattern of Jesus Christ. Let us pray together. Lord God, we thank you for the gifts that you have placed in our lives, people who impart to us faith, people whose memory can help us rekindle faith. And so we pray that we would accept those gifts as gifts from you and be wise stewards of them in this journey. Through Christ our Lord we pray.